Maybe, uh, maybe we get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Teresaki talk series. Today we have Professor Mohamed Zoro uh, giving a talk from Al Faisal University, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Professor Zoro got his PhD from the Department of Instrumentation and Analytical Science at the University of Manchester in 2003. He worked as a postdoc for a few years at the Department of Instrumentation and Analytical Science, Department of Biomaterial Science at the University of Manchester, and also at the Institute of Biotechnology at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Zorop next headed the Biosensors Division at Biophage Incorporated, a biotech company based in Montreal. In 2009, he joined GDG Environmental Limited as a director of R&D. In 2010, he joined INRS, University of Quebec, as associate professor. Then moved to Cranfield University in the UK. Currently, Professor Zorop is a professor at Biosensors at Al Faisal University, uh, KSA. At any time, the Biosensors Lab had a minimum of 20 researchers working in various projects related to biomedical applications. He has published more than 150 scientific papers, more than 13 book chapters, and has 13 patents. He also edited seven books in the area. Professor Zorab, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ali and Muhammad, for the invitation uh, to talk about our research interest here. So the title of my presentation will be Integrated and Ultra-Sensitive Base Sensors for Biomedical Applications. Um, the next 20 minutes, I'm going to focus actually about uh, basically the development of uh, various diagnostic tools for infectious agents. Now we are a days still in the COVID-19, so probably most of you uh, took the swab to check if it has COVID or not. So basically, they're collecting the sample, like what you see here. They are eluting basically this in, in a buffer. Then after that, you take the buffer and you run immunosis or amplification techniques like the PCR, which is basically uh, currently used. So I'll not talk about the advances, advantage of each, of each one of them. I guess we'll highlight a few points. What we like here about the sample collection here, and it will be nice if we can integrate the sensor with the sample collection, so we can eliminate this basically uh, elution buffer step. And then what I like about the immunosy, their simplicity and low cost because you are using a, a paper-based and amplification technique. We like basically the sensitivity and low detection limit. So it will be nice, as I mentioned, if we can develop the diagnostic tools, can get that these advantage the advantage for each for each one of the technique of these techniques, and basically we eliminate the illusion step. So um, at the beginning, I'm going to talk about uh, four different technologies for basically uh, detecting infectious agents. So the first one I'll focus about the cotton swab. So the cotton swab, we started almost five years ago with this PhD student, Saleh, when he started uh, to work with me. I'm not going to talk about food, it's just uh, the story of starting this project. Basically, he's interested in detecting a pathogen in food, in, in food and bilateral processing, like what you see, what, like what you see here. So various food like meat, chicken, and the processing of plants like stainless steel, glass, and the plastics. So we were targeting basically these four different pathogens, which can contaminate basically the, the food and the food processing of plants. So the current practice for detecting the pathogen in these processing plants, normally they use one of these sterilized cotton swab. And then they swab the surface or the meat or the chicken and basically deplate it on a petri dish and they put in the incubator for culturing it for a few days. That's very, very long process. So basically, we came with this idea, basically, is we use a cotton swab in a more rapid way. We use a cotton swab, which is cellulose. So we exercise it using periodate, and then we mobilize different recognition receptors. Depending on the recognition receptor, basically, we are going to use. We can use antibodies, aptamers, peptides, and so on. And we use, basically, all of these in our development. So after you develop this, basically, you go back, as I mentioned before. You swab the surface. If the pathogen you are interested in, uh, there, it will be captured by this recognition receptor. Then you need to visualize basically this binding here. So what we did, we used a cocktail of colored, of different colored nanobeads, and each one of them has recognition receptor for a specific pathogen. For example, take this, the black one as example. So what we have here, recognition receptor combined, for example, for E. coli. So if, I, if this is E. coli, and I'm going to dip it here, what will happen? These, these guys here with the, with the black beads, nanobeads, going to bind here. So what you will see at the end, this the cotton swab will become black. If I have salmonella, so then I will have basically blue color 
and so on. So what we did here, we artificially contaminated three, sorry, we artificially contaminated three different surfaces, the chicken, glass, and stainless steel to basically to mimic the food and food processing plants. We artificially contaminated them with serial dilution of different bacteria, of, of the, of, sorry, artificially contaminated them with serial dilution of these four different bacteria you see in the side here. So what you can see here, when you increase the concentration of the bacteria here, you can see the color become more and more intense for this. So you have different colors for every pathogen. So you can give you an indication what pathogen you have. And if you look here, the analysis time is very short, five minutes. And the sensitivity of this method is really comparable with the BCR, which the minimum it will take around four hours. So it's really, really nice to integrate detection, sample collection, and pre-concentration. Every time you swap the cotton swab on the surface, you pre-concentrate your, basically, your analyte. So here, look here for some of the, basically, the specificity test here. What you see here, the sensor here for salmonellate fumarium. When we expose salmonellate fumarium, it become black, the other bacteria, no color. The same thing for salmonella enteritis and salmonellate fumarium. There's no binding at all as a crystal activity. And the same thing for staph aureus. So what you can indicate this for you, these sensors are quite specific, which is nice. So a few years back, I think more than two and a half years back, this student started with me, uh, her background maker, she started with me, her PhD. So we adopted the same technology for flu A and the flu B. And this you can see the serial, serial dilution for flu A and the flu uh, B antigen. And you can see the color changing. So you can use this the mobile take image and you can write a code for basically uh, for determining the concentration, sorry, the intensity of the color or you can use MHJ as a software, which is uh, available free on the internet uh, uh, from my NIH actually. And you can have, uh, you can have some semi-quantitative information, what concentration pathogen you have. So when we basically develop the sensor for flu A, and then we expose it to MERS-CoV, this is a MERS-CoV actually the virus which hit us before the COVID-19. So, and other human coronavirus, the flu B, there's no cross reactivity. And the sensor for flu B, the same thing. When you expose it to mers cov h -CoV, and the flu A, there is no cross reactivity, which is nice. Then after that, we got hit with mers cov and uh, two, country, two countries which hit it strongly is basically Saudi Arabia and the Republic of Korea, actually, by this virus. So we got some funding, so we adopted this technology for this. So this, you, you can see here, these are the results for different concentration, the serial duration, different concentration of the virus itself. And you can see when you increase the concentration, you can get basically uh, more colored uh, on the cotton swab. And we did here patient samples. We did, we did 12 patient samples here, like what you see here. What you can see when you have the color more, very intense, this means basically the virus load is very high in comparison with others. And if you compare this with the real-time BCR with the run in the hospital, you can see both are really comparable, which is nice. We, of course, when you get hit with the COVID-19, with the COVID-19, so basically we adopted the same technology for COVID-19, serial dilution, and we did the calibration curve as well. So where are we hitting with this technology? What you can see here from each one of these one here, we did of each, one, each one of the Q-tip or the cotton swab, it's used basically uh, for one virus. So what we are we hitting basically? Want to do multiplexing on the same basically Q-tip. So you want to mobilize different trigonosia receptors, sorry, different trigonosia receptors in different areas. So you can have COVID-19 here, mers cov mobilized here, flu A mobilized here, flu B, and so on. And we have a technology for doing this now. So basically you swap the sample, you dip it in the nanoparticles, depends on the color you get, basically can indicate for you what, what basically virus infecting that basically person or that patient, which is nice. We adopted the same technology for resistant bacteria, Staph aureus, and we know it's a big problem. This in the hospital can contaminate basically the hospital and also can infect patients in different location. So we used antibodies and also we used optomers as well for this MRSA and this serial duration and this also the cursory activity as well. Also, we worked with, uh, with KSU, King Saud University here, for detecting adenovirus in the eyes, and thus cause, this can cause a lot of redness in the eyes, basically. So we adopted the same technology for this, but in this case, we didn't use a polymeric nanoparticles. We used the gold nanoparticles decorated with, and with antibody for adenovirus. And you can see here, this is serial dilution, and you can see when you increase the concentration of the virus, you can see the, the color become more and more red. Then after that, we infected this mice, 
basically with the adenovirus in the eyes. And we swab this basically every day. We took a, a swab from dive of this mice every day. So you can see the color after one week, after three days, after three weeks, sorry. You can see it's really dark red. This indicates the virus load is very, very high in the eye of the mice. So what we are working on now to treat the mice and look backwards. They will be basically, when you start the treatment, it will be like this, dark. And you will go backwards, you can see, you'll see a drop in basically in the color until you become clear. So you can basically have a diagnostic tools which can monitor the treatment as well. And this is also which we work with, we work with Dr. Fatma Hamlan from King Faisal Special Hospital. She specialized in human papilloma virus. And basically, normally the females would, who basically doing pub smear, they're using these tools for collecting the, insert inside the female, collect the sample, and basically the central lab to do the, the real time PCR. Which take basically some time. Do you will not get the result before one or two days back? Back. So what we did, we adapted the same technology, but not in the cotton swab with the same tool they are using in the clinic. So basically, after they collect the sample from the female, we dip it in a blue nanobeads, which to create it with recognition receptor can basically recognize only human HBV. And if this tool become blue, like what you see here, this means that female is infected with HBV. If it is still white or there's no change in the color. This indicate that basically that female is a free HBV. So now we'll talk about, uh, we did a lot of work on the swab here, and just these few examples. Then we talk about the electrochemical, which we did recently during the COVID-19. Um, so this, uh, as I mentioned before, these diagnostic tools, the swab basically, it has a plastic tip. It has a plastic base, sorry. And then you have the cotton swab around it. The problem, it has no rule except basically collecting uh, collecting the sample. And then after that, you have to dilute it. So the idea came, instead of using this plastic, can we use basically screen printed electrodes like what you see here? These ones here, have three, have three working, have three electrodes. And you can embolize the recognition receptor we need, or the say you want. And you can have the cotton swab. So you swab it from the throat or from the nose. And then you can connect basically, put in the buffer, and you can connect it basically to your mobile to get basically the measurements uh, in handheld format. So that's what we did. So we did a lot of functionalization for this, depending on the safe format or not go with this. So the virus is there, going to have basically a signal, and you can monitor this in real time with your mobile. This we did, we adopt this technology for basically mers the Middle East, and for the coronavirus. And you can see here change in signal for both, and this is a calibration care for both. And we just published this in ECS and health chemistry recently. Then the cross reactivity, when you have the sensor for MERS-CoV and, and you expose it to the MERS-CoV like what you see here. Sorry, uh, let me get the spotlight back. So when you have the MERS-CoV sensor and you expose the MERS-CoV here, you see drop in the signal and the other verse is no change there. Same thing with the COVID-19 as well. And now we're trying to adopt this technology for a number of other things. So very quickly, we'll touch basically the FRIT-based assays. This basically, we are targeting uh, these viruses, of Homura virus, which is discovered in Saudi Arabia, I think more than 12 years ago, and uh, discovered basically in the animal, which is imported from outside. And that's what's called the Homura. And we target also Rift Valley and COVID-19. In this work, we don't want to develop an instrumentation to slow the development. We need to get uh, uh, quickly on this. So what we did, we used the single, ch the, the different fluorometers, handheld, like single channel. We can buy them 80 channels, like what you see here. Or you can use the lab base, which we have in our lab, like what you see here. So you can also develop this. You can adopt the assay to this, to run high throughput screening for this. So initially, what we are looking for, screening test, not a confirmation test. And instead of running BCR for everybody, which is expensive, we can run a lot simpler, basically, assays, cheaper assays than this one. And this is in collaboration with Dr. Hani and Dr. Raja from my lab. So what we have first, we have to do screening for the proteas, uh, for, sorry, for the peptides. We have a, a short peptide, dipeptides, and you have fluorescence and sequencer, and the other sobernatant for each one of these viruses to this peptide library to see which one will be cleaved. And you can see, you can, you can the result looks like this. You can get some of these spikes. And these spikes are the potential peptide sequence can be used for detecting of this. Then you do cross reactivity and so on. So we took these ones here. So these are the, the one the one has the potential. Then you do cross reactivity to see if it's a cross react with other virus or other pathogen 
in the same location of the body. Then we take this one, the top one here, the most cleaved one. And then after that, we basically incubate it with the serial duration of the virus, like what you see here, from 10 to 10 to the power 8. And you do real-time measurement, seeing the increase in the fluorescence. What you organize here, almost after 20 minutes here, or less than 20 minutes, you get more than 60% of the signal, actually, which is enough to stop, actually, for this. So if you want to draw this, this basically, to, 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 have to, to see this change in signal for different concentrations, this thing having real time, which is very nice too. And look here for the calibration curve, this calibration curve, and look here for the limit detection, it's very, very low. It's almost 15.5, which is very difficult even to get with the BCR. So it's a very nice sensitive method, which you can use basically adapt to say to the, the, the current equipment you have in your lab to develop a sensitive assay, which is a lot shorter than the real-time BCR they are using basically nowadays. So you adapted the same technology with for drift value, like what you see here. So you can see these spikes here, and these the potential uh, dipeptides. Sorry, I, I covered them here because we still didn't publish the, the this work. So this is the real time for basically from 10 to the power 8 of the virus. And this one, the signal, the change, the signal, the fluorescence with different concentration. And the same thing here, you look for the limit detection, it's very, very low. And this is a crystal activity. You export the peptide sequence, of basically, for the different viruses. With the rift value, you can, can have a cyclist, uh, a response. With the others, uh, there's no significant cross uh, reactivity. We did the same thing for the COVID-19, like what you see here. And you can appreciate here the texture limits very low, and we just published this work. Uh, I think a couple of months ago. And then this is the result for the specificity as well. Then we compare the, all the, the samples, the BCR samples you get from the hospital with our FRIT method, and they are highly comparable. Even our method actually more sensitive because can just give us higher signal, and especially at the cutoff. So, so what the advantage of this technology? It's really simple like what you see here. Simple as say, just basically collect the sample, and basically incubate with the peptide sequence. Detection limit, as you saw before, it's highly sensitive. No need for sample processing or extraction of genetic materials, DNA, RNA, as, as people they are doing now, the current practice. It's highly robust, you are using a peptide sequence. So all you need just a peptide sequence, has a FRIT pair on it, and you can run for any virus you are interested in, but you have to find the specific peptide sequence it can be cleaved by that basically virus. In terms of the cost, it's low cost. It's less than 10% of the current PCR techniques. And you can run it in the field. You can use this handheld, or you can run it in the lab. So it can be adopted very easily to, uh, to lab environment at high throughput screening. And you can do, the nice thing about it, you can do also multiplexing. So each one, after I know the peptide sequence for every virus, so we can have different, uh, basically, pair of threat for different virus. And from this, where the fluorescence appearing, basically, we can determine basically what virus infecting that patient, which is really good. Now, the last part of this uh, locus screening assay is the paper based. So this paper based is very well developed. We've been now uh, working on it almost for five years now. So that assay is really simple. We have a paper based here, like what you see here, the setup service of the sensor. After we determine the peptide sequence, which is can be clipped by the proteas, we add a spacer here, another spacer from the bottom, and we conjugate it up to black magnetic beads. And then we fabricate the sensor here. So what you can see, the sensor become black here, like what you see here. This is basically black. This is a fabricate sensor on the top surface. Now, this is the top surface of the paper. In the back, in the back, in the back side of the paper here, we add here a magnet paper, which you see, uh, or, uh, or flexible magnet. This is actually basically the magnet you are sticking things in your fridge. So but we buy basically one meter by one meter, and we cut them into small, to small parts, and we basically stick it in the back of basically of the paper. And basically, if you add your sample there, and there's a protein there, and going, you're going to cleave this guy here. So what will happen, this magnetic beads will be dragged from here to here. So what you see here, changing the color from black to yellow, and then you have accumulation, another spot of accumulation with this magnetic beads, like what you see here. It's a black, become yellow here. And the yellow color intensity here, of the, oh, sorry, the, the area here, how much area yellow color appearing indicate for you the virus load or the pathogen concentration. And the other spot here, also accumulation of these magnetic nanoparticles, which is collected here. So I don't need washing steps here. The moment you add the proteins and get it cleaved, 
So basically, I don't need to add any washing liquids and, and so on. So the magnetic the magnetic beads will be dragged here. So it's a, it's a fast way of basically getting this. So when you started fabricating this, we started using the paper, basically cutter, fabricating this in single sensor, array of sensors. But nowadays, we have in our lab basically automated, so we can have 50, we can produce 50,000 sensors per day, which is really nice. And we published many, many papers on this on this technology for different pathogens. Just one of the initial the initial basically examples we did here, we did for staph aureus and for E. coli, and we contaminated different food matters like what you see here with sealed dilution of the pathogen. All of these one here received them black. This before adding the sample, and then after you add the sample here you can see the yellow color appearing. When the yellow color appearing and you have another spot of magnetic particles here, this, this indicates for you that there is, there, is, there is pathogen there in the food. But the nice thing is here, because we are not targeting the bacteria itself, because if we're going to target the bacteria itself, we will not get better than the detection limit, which is currently available in the market, like in what you see in the lateral flow. So we are targeting here the proteas, which, which basically produced by the pathogen or the byproduct produced by the pathogen. So every pathogen can be reduced basically thousands or even millions of these molecules. So you can push the detection limit to the minimum you can. And at the, at the same time as well, uh, the, the response time will be faster. All what you see here, these colors here, and basically in around one minute time, not 15 minutes time, which is really good. Okay. So we did the same thing for Listeria. This is before and after serial dilution. And you can write the code basically to calculate the yellow color to the black. And you can have a calibration curve, so you can basically get uh, semi-quantum information about the, con the concentration of the pathogen in your food. This is a cross activity here for different bacteria. And you can run this in milk and water and so on. Also, we did some, we adopted some of this basically work to mastitis detection. We, when I was a professor in the UK, uh, we participated in an EU project basically uh, to detect basically the mastitis. Mastitis means there's infection. And basically, in the camel, uh, sorry, in the cow, uh, in the cow, basically, breast, and all the basically all the milk which coming out will be basically contaminated or contaminated. So normally, what do you do when the milking? You connect these milking machines very quickly for all the cows, and if one of them is infected, basically, you're going to contaminate all the milk, and there is no way they can detect very quickly if this cow is basically is infected or not. That's a problem. So, uh, so as a result of this, they have to keep the milk three to four days, basically in cold, in uh, in cold weather, basically, until they do they get the microbiology test. So we tried to develop sensors a few years back on this the automated milking machine, but we were unsuccessful. And this project was almost with 13 EU partners. So I came with this idea a lot similar than this one here. So when we develop these paper-based sensors, we can have this uh, uh, the sensor. And you can add a few drops of this milk here. After 30 seconds, if there's any change in the color, so this indicates where you don't connect this cow because this can be suspected to be infected. So, and basically we know that the mastitis can result from different bacteria, different fungus and different viruses. So we did all these bacteria. And now we're interested to look also for different fungus and viruses which can cause basically mastitis. Also, this is another example from another PhD student. We're looking basically protein of neurotoxin. This basically before and after serial dilution. What you can see here, the results are, are basically prepared by different students. So you can see the layout is different and the presentation is different. So if you cut this area here, which is this one here, just to see the active area of the sensor, not the baby, not the base paper, and this area here, you can see it here. What you can realize very quickly, when you increase the concentration of the pathogen here, you can see the yellow color appearing more and more and more and almost in less than one minute. This is another PhD student. Now she's finishing. She looked she look basically for the Bijin Divalis bacteria, which can cause periodontitis. So normally the dentist, what they do, they take this absorbing paper, small paper with the tweezer, and basically they, they insert it here in the teeth to collect cyt cytokines and different markers, bacteria, and so on, and send it to the lab to do assay, to do basically testing. So normally they run immunoassays or culturing for the bacteria. For culturing, it's very, very slow, take a few days. So what we did, we fabricated the sensor on these basically papers, like what you see here, and we exposed it to different concentration of Bijin Jivalis. You can see here the color is changing. We did also more than 450 basically patient samples. What you can see here, this is a typical result you get. 
the yellow color is changing from black to yellow here, and this accumulation of basically magnetic nanoparticles. So our collaborators basically ask us also to run the same sensors for uh, two proteases, HNE and cathepsin G, which basically related to periodontitis. We did the same thing here before, that was here and after here for one, uh, for HNE and for cathepsin G the same. And also we did multiplexing here, what you can see two sensors for two basically, for two, we are, sorry, we are targeting two different basically uh, uh, proteases, cathepsin G and HNE, and we mix them with different ratios like what you see here. And you can see the, the signals is comparable with the concentration of each of the enzyme. Then we run here patient samples with the, with the two, and basically we can see two change in the uh, two change it's uh, sorry change in the color of the two sensors like what you see here but you can see in the HNE humanitarian um, stays basically neutral state is basically higher the change and now we're trying to add the Beijing device a third sensor and our dentist collaborator do want to add us to do want to add other basically markers to be able uh, to help them in diagnosis of other diseases as well so we're hoping to look for five six sensors uh, on the same platform Sahar also, PhD student, also she worked with the P, uh, uh, the Zones Arginosa, which is a nasty pathogen, also can continue the hospital. CDC did a serial dilution. And we are very lucky because we are next door to the King Faisal Specialist Hospital, which is the best in the area, actually. So we have very good collaborators there. So they provide us with, the, with patient sample, put them um, ear, wound, the throat, burns, and we run them as well on the same technology and worked very well, too. Here another example with uh, Dr. Wendy Kamal from TNO from Netherlands. She has interest in anthracis. So basically we did anthracis detection here, like what you see here. And basically we did also mice. You can see this is serum from the mice before the infection. It's before and after add the serum. There's no, there's no cleavage at all. And after the mice get infected with the anthracis, you can see here change in the color. So instead of basically here looking for mouth and uh, basically, sorry, for in the serum, now we are interested, we basically, we are interested to collaborate with here, looking for mouth, even or nasal liquid to be tested than using basically the blood and so on, because it's quicker and you don't need to collect the blood. And hopefully we will, we will continue this work with here. Uh, this is another basically black mold, and this is another nasty uh, infectious agents we're hearing now. And we did this work actually a couple of years ago and it's published last year. And this actually, we did uh, a lot of work on it in our hospital stairs and even our university stairs, dust and soils and so on. We adopt the same technology for this and we were able to take it and uh, we compared it basically with the non-specific commercial available assays, which is commercial available. Then this is another project for legionella detection. This legionella, it's a big issue in cooling towers and you have to take it basically there. Uh, to do detection there. The problem they're collecting and sending you 500 mil samples and you have to run the 500 mil samples. So you have to do a lot of sample processing and then reconcentrate and then run BCR. That's the current practice. So we said, can we use the same technology for targeting the proteas for this legionella? So the, our industrial collaborator, basically they have these six uh, strains of legionella they're interested in, like what you see here. Interestingly, what when we run them with our dipeptide library, we find five of them you see in the blue color here they can cleave one peptide sequence, which is very good. So I need only one sensor. So I don't need to use different sensors for these five. So you can use one sensor to take the five of them, basically. Unlike the BCRs, you need the primers for each one of these strands. And the second one here, which basically we are not able to take it with that sensor. So we are trying now to develop another second sensor for it. So we did the same thing for it uh, with different uh, uh, concentration. And we also did the cross selectivity. Uh, for it. We do also Brasilia detection. Here, the people in the Gulf area, uh, they love camels a lot. So they drink uh, milk camel, they eat uh, milk meat, and so on. It's amazing. So we have a project with the Brasilia as well. So we, we, did, we use the same technology for Brasilia detection and this uh, calibration curve and this different concentration. Also, we worked uh, in a collaboration with Dr. Azia from University of Science, Malaysia looking for some native T uh, uh, basically, which is basically, which is called typhoid. And this is since before and this after serial dilution and this is cross reactivity. So it's worked very well, this technology. 
It's another BIG student, same, same student. So basically, we, you, we looked basically in a very big project now running for more than three years, basically looking for different markers for mice, uh, in mice actually, for looking for acute respiratory diastasis syndrome, which we called ALI, ARDS. And we developed a lot of sensors on this. And even we were looking, we are interested mainly in looking for early markers. And like what you see here, we targeted different markers here. And we looked at the time to see which one can be used at early marker, not at late, basically at this stage. We are interested in early marker. And now this work is ongoing as well. So the nice thing about this sensor which I showed you, especially the paper ones, we can print them on papers, we can print them in cloth, we can print them in tape, and so on. So we can use them for applications, which is we can't run PCR on it. For example, like, like, the, like what you see here, what we did here, we, did, we integrated the sensors with the contact lens containers. So if you, when you put the contact lens in the container, if there's a change in the color, basically, of the sensor in the morning, so basically that's indicate for you the contact lens is basically contaminated. So you did a lot of these applications the last few years using this technology. And this is another example. The people has a, who has a kidney failure, normally what they have, this catheter basically connected to their body permanently. So they connect this on and off with this basically between your dialysis bag. It has two bags, one as a drain to collect basically the waste from their, basically from their body, from their abdominal, and they have fresh liquids coming in. So what we did in this, in the drain here, so you can see I cut it here and we integrate the sensor. We fabricate the sensor on a silly tape and we stick it there. And the sensor looks black. The problem with these guys, they connect it, they just connect this three times. So normally this is a problem, it's a lifetime problem for them. So if they, if they want to keep taking antibiotics, this can cause for them resistance. So you want to help them at early stages, basically, if they get infected or not. So what you can see here, if that person is infected, what you can see since some change from black to yellow color here. So basically give indication to that patient, to that person, basically, you must seek basically uh, medical treatment quickly. So you did a lot of these applications, we'll not talk about this. I just will skip it and just go to another technology. With the COVID-19 as well, not antibodies, also develop optometers in my lab, targeting S, E, and N, and we develop sensors for them and so on. Where are we heading with this work now? Doing multiplexing, basically, using optometers for different opt for different for different viruses, respiratory viruses. So when you add basically the sample here, we can determine what what virus basically that person is infected. So that work is ongoing as well. Also, we do a lot of work as well with Professor Rahman Nuruddin from Malaysia. She's, she's basically hitting the infectious disease center there, which is very nice. And that's what I'm hitting almost every year there for collaborating, for collaborating in various projects related to infectious diseases. So we have interest with here to do sensors for parasitic diseases. And we have a lot, I have six different diseases we are targeting with here develop sensor. So we develop optomers as recognition receptors for them. And also we do the sensing. So I'm not repeating this. Uh, is, is, is just to highlight that also we have some interest in parasitic disease detection. This is another project which is Babak was doing with me almost a few years back now. Probably uh, you saw him at Harvard. Um, so what doing? What the people are doing basically in, in the hospital normally or nowadays, did you have this microtether blade, the run PCR on the COVID-19 or any infectious diseases? And at the end of the day, what you have here a lot of these plastics, which is contaminated, which basically you need basically uh, to decontaminate before you're getting rid of this. So the idea of this project is to using, uh, using tons of this plastic. Can we run the whole hospital in one tape format, highly miniaturized, and you can use a flexible polymer to have a chambers of these to mimic these ones here. You have all the reagents are, are basically stored there and you have a self-sealable polymer. You can have two scenarios, either inject this one here or load the sample and strip from the top and basically you basically keep basically going on in this role and you can run, you can heat it to 65 degrees, do the lamp amplification, and then you can run it back like what you see here. So we did this with E. coli staff and we can bring this a bench top. This worked, it worked very well. So the idea is basically in, in producing tons of these, basically can we run the whole hospital in one tape format? And we did a lot of work in this. I will not go because you can just look in our application. Now what we're trying to do is here, integrate this ultrasonic disruptor here. After we load all the samples, like what you see here, we need basically to lyse the, the pathogen or the virus. And that's one of the hardest steps actually. People delicing 
using chemical agents. And then after that, they have to pre-concentrate or fish the genetic materials from this because these chemicals normally they inhibit the amplification later. So you have to, to fish it and then after that do BCR. So we're trying to avoid this. And this actually can be run also electricity free. You can use the hand warmer here, just open it to react with, with air. And you can have 65 degrees basically around this one here in a nice way. And you can run it electricity free as well in the field. Uh, this is actually another project which is Minhaz you know, is doing a postdoc uh, in my lab. Now he's a social professor to Brunei Dar es Salaam University in Brunei. Uh, one of the major problem with the peak, with the real time BCR is a fluorescent dye. That's adding the cost. I, I don't believe the primer is adding a lot of cost. I think the fluorescent dyes are really, really expensive. So we focused on this, basically trying to eliminate these fluorescent dyes using basically very cheap chemicals like electric chemical redox. And we can do this in a standard format using the hospital or in our basically uh, uh, tape format. So that, the simple, that is really, really simple. You can buy this chemical almost with, I think, $50, you can buy, I think, probably 400 gram this, which is enough for almost 1 million uh, BCR, BCR uh, test. So when you have this basically redox molecule in contact with electrode, so you have high current, like what you see here in A here. When you amplify the DNA, what will happen? These, molecule, these redox molecules will be intercalated between the DNA, so do not be in contact with electrodes. So what you see here, drop in the current. So you can do endpoint before and after you can monitor it, or we can monitor this in real time, like what you see here. This is what we did for staph urease and for E. coli, similar to the BCR. And, and recently what we did, we developed this, this basically uh, miniaturized uh, machine for this, for doing this work. This can run 96, integ integrate with the heater as well, and real time monitoring. And you can see here, this is basically the 96 meter blade, which can, you can fit. And this basically the not just that. All you need just to connect this to the to your laptop and start getting the real time measurements. This is another project for basically for another master student. She's just finishing now in my lab. Basically, here we're looking for a scene to back a scene to bacter bomani resistant genes. And this is a big issue actually in the Middle East, even in the U.S. Because most of the actually the army who served in the in Afghanistan in the Middle East. Basically, they carry this, this, this basically, uh, this bacteria and they went back, they contaminated the Canadian hospital and the US hospitals actually. So the idea is we want to detect this, these, these resistant genes uh, to help the doctor basically or the clinician in choosing the, the best antibiotics. So we're targeting these four genes. So basically this polymeric level chip, what you see here, and this is schematic for it. You collect the sample with the cotton here then basically here, it's heated to 95 degrees, so it has a buffer, so it will basically lyse the, the, the bacteria, and you'll have the genetic material basically flowing here to these four or five channels here, which has basically the amplification reagents for each one of them for different genes like what you see. And what you can see here, this basically, we are amplifying this gene, and thus you see the color change from this color to this, and this, there's no amplification there. The same thing here, this basically, and there's no amplification there and so on. And when you amplify the four genes here, you can see the four colors become yellow. And this is a very nice, you can integrate all the steps in one polymeric level chip. And we have interest also to, to use this also for COVID-19 and that's what we are working on. And this is just only master thesis basically from my lab. Also in the lab, we do a lot of work in optomers as a replacement for antibodies. We'll not go through all of this. Uh, the nice thing about optomers we do in vitro process, you can, do, you can select for any analyte, at low cost, they are highly stable, especially the DNA, like and uh, not unlike antibodies, and you can do a lot of chemical modification. And that's, the nice thing about them, they, they are small in size. So they are almost one over, basically one ten, basically one over ten of the size of the antibody, and this can end up in a huge application, uh, basically in imaging, sensing, and so on, which is very good. So this says we will be using this basically six, and we run it in our lab. I will not go through this but it's very lengthy and very boring steps, a lot of repeating and so on. So we're trying to basically simplify this and instead of basically embracing our, our, our analyte on a, on a solid surface, we try to embrace now our electrode. And then when you add the, the library of the DNA, if there's binding there, so we can see drop in the signal. So we're trying to cut, to cut a lot of these steps to have it quicker. And we adopted this technology for small molecules like hormone and small, small a big protein like basically DOC8, which is a marker for newborns. And the result for this between the traditional one and our electrochemical is comparable, which is nice. 
Um, also, we used optometers sensors for therapeutic drug monitoring. I'll not go through this because a few be a few weeks back we have a speaker talked about about it here. So the nice thing about this here, what we want to see here, just this can help us in personalized medicine and adjusting the dose for uh, for the patient. And uh, these are the current practice, very big bulky machines. So Blasco actually wrote a good, nice review article recently about this. So you can use like basically a small device like basically the glucose sensors, or you can do basically real-time uh, detection for this. So we are we are basically having three, three BSG students working in different chemotherapy drugs with the hospital next door to us. So you have a number of them we are interested to basically to, 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 do, to, do, to take them basically, to do optometers, to find the KD, and then we develop sensors for them and so on. And there's some of the crucial activity for these basically for the chemotherapy. And the problem with this chemotherapy, it's very rare to give one during the treatment. You can use a combination, not, not at the early stage, at later stage, because the cancer cells can be resistant. So these are combination of two or three and so on of these basically drugs. So we want basically to take them. Um, so where, where are we heading with this? Uh, we are interested in developing closed loop based sensor for this. You can collect the sample, do that same using the optometers, which is very easy, or basically you can integrate this with the flexible substrate, or you can use micro needle, uh, like Dr. Ali Khadim Husseini, what he developed recently with his team. Uh, this is another lab chip for also cancer profiling here. Since we work with tissue, then you need digestion, extraction, and sensing. We developed this platform for a number of analytes recently, and probably you saw some of this probably some of this details about this in our in our publications. So we have what is have here, we have here flow through fishing system. And basically, you have magnetic nanobeads, and you have the ignition center around it, which can you fish analytes specifically are interested in, in do washing, and then after that, we take it to the, the sensing bar, and each one of these sensors is integrated with the magnetic coils, so you can basically enhance the signal, and basically you can reverse, so I don't need washing steps, and you can see here, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Qasim Ramadan, we can push attraction and repulsion, and you can develop this in array format for basically sensing. We adopted this to uh, just as one of the examples we did MDM2 uh, protein and uh, it worked very well. Some of the crystal activity. Also Dr. Shema, she did some of the liver cancer stem cells here. We targeted four of these in one of the projects. And basically here we, did, we, uh, we are working now with Dr. Kostam Ramadan to do pre-concentration of the, of the cells in this system. Then after that, we can do the, the sensing, so you can go down to single to single cells, basically. We have also, I just have a few minutes more. So um, we have also um, uh, did some work the last few years in newborn screening. And this due to the fact here in the Middle East people, uh, they are marrying their relatives a lot for the kids. And they have some, basically some newborn, some newborn diseases. Normally, what you do the current practice, basically, they have these papers here, and basically they punch the back of the feet of, of this small baby, and they collect the blood like what you see here, they, they dry it, and they send it to center lab to run either ELISA or a chromatography, this mass spectrometry, MSMS, basically on this, which is high cost, time consuming, and you need basically high skilled person to run it. So the idea is we have a long list from our collaborator that are interested to detect. So basically what we did here, this paper for collecting the, the blood, what we have, we integrate this from the back with sensor, this the front side. Each one of these spots, you can see eight sensors in the back here. You can see it is eight spots. So you can take eight analytes at the same. And you can use the paper here, basically as a filter paper, basically to filter and to remove the blood cells and you can collect the serum from the back of the paper and we can do the sensing. And all you need just a nurse collect the sample and run the assay on this on the spot instead of sending a center lab to the analysis. So our collaborator has interest in hyper IG syndrome. So they target the they informed us we have to work on DC3 and proteins. We did work on DC protein, uh, so we did a lot of uh, functionalization and so on, these sensors. And this sensor uh, basically fabrication, calibration curve, texture limit, what you can see here, they have very good texture limit in comparable with the standard ELISA here. And you can see our publications and this cross reactivity. This serum sample, these are patient samples, here's just a control, and you can see even with the patient samples working very well. And also we did for cystic fibrosis, DMD, and SMA, and so on. And Dr. Shaman, my lab, also she compared different nanomaterials for this, 
سقق كاربون جرافايت جرافين جرافين اوكسايد كاربون نانو فايبر مالتي وول كاربون نانو تيوب سينجل وول كاربون نانو تيوب and uh, a lot of a lot of details about this you can you can just find them in our uh, publications and what you can see here the detection limit is it's really really nice even comparable even even better than basically some detection technique and there's some of the specificity of crystal activity testing it's a serum and you can see these data are comparable with basically the ELISA also we have interest in hematological applications so we do a lot of work on application I will not go through details of this but uh, you can see some of our publications. We have interest in sickle disease, thalassemia, and uh, so we develop optomers for all of these. Also, recently we developed optomers as well for dabigitran, which is anticoagulant. Now it's used as a replacement basically for warfarin, but there is no uh, methods for detecting this. So we developed uh, sensors for this. And this, I'll stop here. These are some of the, the books which is might be interested to any one of you if you're interested, uh, which is nice. Um, also, we did one book with Dr. Ali Khadam Husseini as well, uh, almost uh, seven years ago. At the end, I'd like to thank my lab, uh, who did all the work which I presented for you. I did it, actually most of the lab. I uh, sorry, did most of the lab work, which is nice, and I would like to acknowledge them. And also, I'd like to acknowledge the funding agency and I would like also to thank you for your participation. And I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk, uh, Mohamed. Appreciate. Um, so one question is, can you talk about the uncertainty of results in your proposed method? Uh, depends on depends on each technique. But generally speaking, to be, to be accepted, it has to be less than basically 5%. Error, basically. Okay. Have you done experiments to well, determine the change of your active surface area after you have deposited gold nanoparticles onto the electrode? We, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Have you done experiments to determine the change of your surface area after you have deposited gold nanoparticles onto the electrodes? Oh, we did a lot of characterization. Dr. Shema did a lot of characterization. We sent a lot of sample to cost in Jeddah for uh, for this. Yeah, you can just you can just have a look to our publication. You can see a lot of different characterization technique we used. I see. Do you, does your proposed peptide detectors act as chromatography, and how can we increase the accuracy of the method? As a chromatography, no, yeah. it's completely different. It's not as a chromatography. But here we use it as a sensing. Here, what we what we are looking for is basically the cleavage of the peptide sequence by the proteas. So we have fluorescence and sequential, basically. I don't know how we can. You can use the HBLC fluorescent detector to detect the cleavage, basically, because you will not see any fluorescence. Then you see fluorescence. But mm, we trying to we trying to run away from the chromatography. Uh, we want just to have very very simple assay in a homogeneous format, but also. If, if you see these initial steps, then after that, we integrated with the papers. After we determine the specific peptide sequence, which can be cleaved by every pathogen, then we integrate with the paper. So all the homogeneous assays, this it can be used as assay, but that's what uh, we like to use a, a paper base, and that's what we developed the paper base. I don't know about the chromatography, probably they are, they are talking about um, paper for flowing and so on. Um, since you're using, we tried this, since we use nanobeads, the nanobeads will be basically we trapped and basically in the paper. So you're not, you have a lot of problems in the cadre chains because these papers will be basically permanently stuck basically in the papers, if that, if that what they mean. Yeah, I think that's my guess too. The second question is, what strategy did you use for generating peptide and DNA aptamers and stability of aptamers on the swap? In the swab, uh, the aptamers are, are stable, by the way. When basically we send them to cotton, we send them in the cotton swab, we send them on electrodes, we send to Japan, to Australia, to Canada at room temperature. After one after one week or 10 days, they are highly stable. So I don't see any problem with this. The problem with, with the aptamers specifically is basically they can be cleaved by the endocleases, basically. That's that's one of the biggest issues. But since we are basically we are looking for basically in a very short time we don't inject them in the body for a long time so it's fine kind of job uh, fine 
Uh, for the peptides, as I mentioned, the critical step is to find the peptide sequence, which, uh, sorry, to find the peptide sequence which can't be cleaved by other pathogen, other virus or bacteria which exist in the same location. And that's you can you can do screening during screening step. You can you can you can you can, you can identify this very quickly. We have we generated a lot of data the last almost seven eight years. A lot of Excel files, so you know every peptide sequence in our library can be cleaved by what pathogens. So we can determine and we can tell if it's very specific or not, or can cross react with 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 what other with what other pathogen or viruses. Thank you. What kind of aptamer RNA and DNA has better affinity and stability in these sensors? Uh, I most of the will be saying RNA. It's more specific, but uh, in the selection process, it's it's more complicated, extra steps, and RNA the stability is a, is a big issue for us. That's what we are using in my lab. We are using DNA, DNA aptamers. They're stable. Uh, students working with it easily. Nice way, they are highly stable. As I mentioned to you, we send them on devices almost almost uh, everywhere, and they are fine. Great. Um, the person is asking about commercialization strategy. Wow, like, that's the hardest one. Uh, to be honest started, with you, I, I work with. Yeah, have you started companies or any of them being, you know, translated or things like that? Uh, that's, uh, I had a very bad experience with the startup. I worked at a startup for four years, almost in Canada. It's just a nightmare. If you don't, if you are not really rich and you have a lot of financial support to go up to the product, forget it. You just uh, draining yourself and, uh, so you need a lot of financial support until you get the product in the market. I've seen colleagues who basically sold their houses and they invested in their own companies and at the end they lost the houses and they didn't even get, uh, the company, they were not successful because you have competitors all the time coming. So you need to be aware of this. So the starting spin-off uh, for me, I think we did with, with the students, not myself. I have no time absolutely to think about this. Uh, but the students, yes, and I always encourage them, the grad students from their own project uh, to think about commercialization, starting their spin-off and they help them. It's fine with me, but um, absolutely, uh, I honestly, uh, I have no interest in, in establishing a spin of myself and running it. It's just a training, seriously. Okay. All right. What is the stability a long time of the bioreceptor attached to the cotton swab? It's exactly similar to the lateral flow papers. We have, couple, we have cotton swab uh, stored for two and a half years. And tr trust me, it's still working almost 90%. They retain more than 90% of their activity. But you have to keep them lyophilized with the antibodies. So you keep them lyophilized in enclosed envelopes. They are fine, they are working. With the optimers, they are they are highly stable. We don't have a problem with the optimers, seriously. But with the antibodies, but if you lyophilize them, you can keep them at room temperature for more than the recent ones, more than two and a half years, and sell more than 90% of the they, they retain more than sorry, they retain more than 90% of their activity. Thanks. How do you compare the immunoassay and molecular methods efficiency? Depends. Depends. Immunoassays um, are good. Uh, the problem with the immunoassays, seriously, they have a lot of problems. The cross reactivity is a very big issue, especially if you are working with analytes very close in the structure. One. Two, the antibody is the problem. I always call it a uh, big, bulky, stupid molecule. I'm sorry using this word. The antibodies is like this, okay? And you have these active sites here. If for small molecules, if you are going, if it bind here, there's no change because the antibody is too big. There's no change of confirmation. It's really, really big, huge, the antibodies. And that's why they are not very good for small molecules at all. So you have to do extra steps for the small molecules. But for the optomers, if you have optomers, and there's a change in the confirmation in the binding, when the optomer, basically it hugged the analyte, okay? It fold around the analyte. So for especially for small molecules, they are they have they have many many advantages over the antibodies, plus the stability. You don't need to worry about about the antibodies. Antibodies, if you don't directly lyophilize it, you can't keep it outside more than three hours. It's dead. It's gone basically, and expensive. Seriously, it's very expensive. When 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 my students coming to me and telling me that you have to sign this basically, 
uh, order, every antibody we order almost 600 to 800 dollars, even some of them a thousand dollars. They are commercially available. So they are really expensive. Optomers, if you know the sequence, you know, if you know the sequence, you send it to any company, you will get the same sequence. Antibodies, every company de develop an antibody for the same analyte. Uh, most of them, more than 90%, they are not working. Trust me. Take the last example to COVID-19. We tested, I think, more than 230 antibodies. People, they claim they are basically specific for COVID-19. The cross-reactivity, I can tell you, for most of them, more than 60, 70% with other viruses. Take other example, the, the food allergens. Food allergens, when one, with one allergy, we ordered more than 27 antibodies at some point. We tested all of them, different companies. So the, um, even from batch to batch, antibody, you have variation. With the optomers, if you know the sequence, you select it and you know the sequence, you send it to any company, you get the same sequence. And you just basically embrace in your sensor and just do that say. Um, there's, I, I tell you, um, there's many, many advantages of uh, optomers or even peptides over basically over over the antibodies. There's, there, there's many, many advantages. So I try to avoid using antibodies seriously. And even if you want to do imaging, we have some activities imaging or targeted uh, basically delivery. Uh, with the antibodies, in, they're huge. For example, they can't cross the blood the brain barrier. So how do, you, how, how do you want to do? You want to do basically protein engineering, single chain and cut it and keep cutting, keep cutting. I, I have a colleague who spent seven years developing one, anti, one basically a small a fragment of antibody to be able to working for imaging in the brain. Seven years. I remember he gave me the, and when I started talking to him about optomers and so on, he told me, Muhammad, just take this analyte and just go away and don't come back to me unless if it's working. And you did all the in vitro testing. With a new BIG student in six months, Six months later, we came with him with a specific optomers he run in the animal, in his own lab, and compared with antibodies, who spent seven years in developing it. It's, it even it worked better. So there's many advantages for optomers over antibodies. I try to avoid them, seriously. All right, thank you. What optomer, DNA optomer or peptide alternate has better selectivity and stability? With the with the optomers, we have we have uh, good experience. The peptides, optomers, I I didn't use them in my lab. I'm I'm seeing a lot of articles coming, but I didn't use them, so I can't judge it. Well, I'm going to ask a personal uh, from our lab questions. We we have done a lot of uh, impedance based biosensing, and we use ferrocyanide. Do you use uh, or can you avoid ferrocyanide to amplify the signal? You can, depends on the analyte you are, you are interested in. Not always we're using ferrocyanide. You can also use the ruthenium, depends on the analyte. Yeah, we were the, doing, um, we, we do a lot of secreted molecules from organs on a chip for non-invasive or minimal invasive testing. And liver secretes, serloplasmin, albumin, and we were trying to detect those proteins. Um, and the, we, we use this ferrocyanide for amplification, but if you want to have a you know wearable type of device, obviously that's not, Good. Anyway, uh, any, yeah. There is you can you can overcome it. I, I I think your issue you don't want to use it all the time. Correct. That's 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 uh, that's your problem. You don't want to use it in continuous way and in flowing in flowing way. That's uh, that's a question. Uh, the the question is the need for ferrocyanide to amplify the signal. And many times these are single use. And that was my second question. Is it's it not possible. about doing multiple use uh, biosensors? We did real time detection for a long time, but not in the way you are mentioning, because the problem is every time you need a fresh ferrocyanide, fresh that's what I was telling you before. Uh, so that's a problem. So you can overcome it actually by there's different strategies. One of them, you can conjugate the ferrocyanide or you can change your format of the assay. Okay. And instead of using direct, you could use uh, other techniques or you could actually, you don't even need antibodies. You can use other assays as well, which is a lot simpler, a lot easier than antibodies. We can talk about this, Mohammed, in more details. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you. Excellent talk. That's all the questions I have. Thank you for your time. And again, uh, you know, a lot of data, a lot of results. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too.